All right, uh, we're finally live. We had a huge delay. We are going to wait just a little bit to see if we can get uh, some some people watching. We have a few people in in the the shot now. Uh, my name is Jim Bader. I'm the planetarium program coordinator here for the UTA Planetarium. I do want to say and ask you all uh, greatly if you have questions during this live stream, let us know. Uh, drop it in the chat. We're gonna we're gonna respond to you and interact with you guys. The whole point of these streams is so that we can interact with the public uh, and talk to you guys about stuff hopefully you're interested in and stuff we're very much interested in. So tonight is uh, officially the International Observe the Moon Night and uh, people all over the world are observing the moon. The whole purpose of this night really uh, is to talk about um, just interest in astronomy and the moon is the most accessible thing. It's super easy to see the moon with a pair of binoculars. You don't need a telescope or any fancy equipment that we're going to be using tonight. Uh, really easy to see it and uh, we want to be able to share this with you guys so that you can see it uh, a little more close up than you might be able to with a pair of binoculars. Uh, we're going to be using a, a pretty big telescope here. It's an 11 inch Schmidt Cassegrain if you watched our telescope episode. If you want to know more about what that means you can go back to our live start stream about the uh, Schmidt Cassegrain or just telescopes in general. Um, this is a big one. It's certainly expensive and hopefully we don't destroy it tonight. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to look at the moon. Um, we're going to look at Jupiter. We're going to look at Saturn. And if we have time or we have questions, we might uh, mess around and try to find something else. Uh, I do want to just go ahead and give a shout out to Jennifer Jones. She is one of our, our uh, UTA employees. She's helping out in the background. You guys can't see her, but she's there. She's going to be helping moderate the comments. And in case I have to step away from the computer to work on the telescope, you guys might see her. So we'll we'll see about that anyway. <laughs> so uh, without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and take a look um, at what we can see on the moon. Uh, we'll pop in here. So we have a few things on the screen I want to talk about before we jump into this. The first thing that I want to point out is the camera of the moon. Obviously, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna see that it's a little blurry, it's a little jittery. This is a live view from the telescope that's sitting right next to me. Uh, and it is highly zoomed in. So if there's any wind, or if I move too much, for instance, if I were to stomp my feet, you can see that uh, actively shake. So if you see a little shakiness, just bear with us. It should calm down and you should be able to see something as you move through it. Uh, this is completely uh, caused by the telescope being so zoomed in and the tiniest little movement will cause it to jitter just a little bit and it's enough that it can be a little obnoxious at times. Other things, I do have uh, an idea of what we're using to show this. We're using uh, the Celestron X-Star 11 GPS uh, telescope and we're using a really cheap, totally affordable Orion Starshoot USB camera. Uh, we didn't have the time to put together um, a big setup for you guys but we wanted to get into this so this will do for now. You can certainly see the moon and I can't wait to show you other things like Jupiter or Saturn that are a little bit harder to see. Um, also, we're going to have the object we're talking about listed there on the screen. So you can see that it's we're looking at the moon and its approximate distance is 240,000 miles away. Uh, really, really far. Just to give you an idea of what that means, uh, humans, we don't really go very far into space. We've been to the moon, right? But when we send humans to the International Space Station, for instance, uh, they only go about uh, 250 miles straight up. So it's not really far, uh, not in compared to the moon where you're a thousand times farther away, quite literally. Uh, when we switch over to Jupiter, you're going to see that distance go 
uh, it's going to increase exponentially. So it should be a little fun to hopefully see your reactions to those changes. Um, anyway, uh, yes, Elizabeth, we're glad you're here watching and uh, hope that you enjoy these views of stuff in our solar system and maybe outside of the solar system later on. We'll, we'll see how things are going as we move farther into this. So uh, let's talk about the moon just a little bit. I can control this. We can move it around. Uh, this is a really, really close up view of the moon. You can see in this view, uh, we have some craters visible. Um, we got a pretty big one there. Uh, we can talk about this. I don't know the name of this crater off the top of my head, uh, but before it gets too far away from us, uh, this is a special crater. So we have a crater here. Let me try to center it a little bit better. Oop, wrong direction. Um, this crater right in the center. This is what um, we would call uh, a little special crater because if you see something particularly different about this crater in the center rather than the larger crater in the bottom left of the screen. So the one in the center has within it a little a little divot, a little small mountain there. This is due to the type of impact. So when you have objects that are maybe a little more dense and they land like this, they can cause these uh, uh, special types of craters. It's pretty interesting to see that immediately we see it. Now, now looking at the moon to us, we can always see the craters um, from, from here. You can look at the moon and see craters. But really the changes that we see on the moon are changes uh, from the look. So we have these areas that are flat and dark. Uh, these are what we call maria. But a long time ago, they thought they were oceans or seas. So we still keep their names uh, relevant to that. So for instance, uh, names you might see would be Sea of Tranquility um, and Sea of Storms and places that we have landed with the Apollo landings. Uh, this telescope, by the way, is not powerful enough to see those, so we're not gonna look or try to find anything. Uh, those uh, spacecraft that landed on the moon were really small and we, we won't be able to, to see them uh, for sure. <coughs> Anyway, uh, we got uh, the planetarium, uh, Stephanie, is not open right now. We are still waiting with COVID happening uh, to, to get things going again. And we, we have a lot of uh, red tape to go through, but we also want to keep you guys safe. So we don't want to be bringing people into the planetarium when it's not safe yet. That's for sure. But as soon as it's, it's safe to have people in there, we'll be opening back up to the public. We will certainly announce it for everybody to see. Now, I want to talk about something really cool, and it's the most ridiculously named uh, object in astronomy. So right here in the frame now we can see on the right side we do see some light. We see it's lit up. On the left side it's dark. We're looking at the edge of the moon. This is not um, the edge where the moon is no longer there, but this is the edge where the moon is no longer visible. So the dark area. When we look up at the moon uh, tonight, for instance, if you guys want to go outside and do this, you certainly can see it. Um, you'll see that you see most of a moon phase, but you're missing a little sliver. You're missing a crescent. So we're looking at that edge where it goes to darkness. Now this line that separates the light to the dark uh, is called, this is its official name, the Terminator line. All right, maybe that wasn't too exciting, but to me that's really ridiculous. Quite a ridiculous name to say the least. Uh, so we've seen um, some craters on the moon. We've seen the Terminator line. But something people don't mention very often is that there are mountains on the moon. We have mountains here on Earth. But on the moon, there are also enormous mountains, too. It's not just a flat, you know, landscape. Uh, there's certainly not trees, so it's going to seem quite a bit more barren. But we do have a lot going on there, uh, surface-wise. It's, uh, it's certainly not just flat. Uh, one of the most exciting places to look at the moon whenever you're observing it yourself, let's just say with a pair of binoculars, which is easy shot. You can see something nearly just this clear with a pair of binoculars. Uh, is you want to look for the edge of, of the moon, whether it's near the Terminator line or you're looking near the edge of the moon, because of the way light works and is reflecting off of these craters and mountains, you can see so much more depth. So this is a great shot that really uh, shows that. Uh, you can see this crater here on, on the left, kind of center left area. Uh, this crater is showing a, a bunch of depth to it because you can see the shaded area on the right and it gives you an idea of how deep that is. And those are deep. Those are not like little divots in the ground. The moon is huge. It's like uh, relative to the similar area as Russia. So if you were to take Russia and turn it into its own little ball, that's about how big the moon is. It's still really, really big. It's not going to be like running around a football field, a circle. Definitely not. It's, it's huge. 
But this is a really cool thing to do with a pair of binoculars because you can see not just stuff on the moon, but you can get an idea of how big the moon really is uh, and how deep those craters must really be. Also, near the tops and bottoms of the moon, uh, we believe that there would be a possibility for water stored in ice, but water, drinkable water that, well, wouldn't be drinkable, but it's still water nonetheless. We could make it drinkable if we landed on the moon. And the craters near the North and South Pole, they don't get a lot of light. Uh, or if they do get a light, it will be just a small amount of light for a small portion of the day. So just like the Arctic uh, here on Earth can stay frozen all year round, areas on the moon would be the same. So if we were to go to the moon to set a base up, going to these craters in the North and South Pole to harvest water for things like, well, drinking water, um, fuel, but even being able to pull the oxygen out uh, to, to breathe, which would be fantastic. And if you're going to live on the moon, it'd be nice to be able to breathe. There's no doubt about that, but um, super interesting. Either way, uh, let's let's go a little bit farther over, see what else we can see. We're kind of, our exposure's a little blown out in this area, so we may have to make some setting changes to see that. Uh, let's see if we can find a large, large crater on the bottom here. Bear with me while I, I edit some things to make this a little bit more visible for us. I've got a underexpose this just a bit so that we can see it better. That looks that looks much, much better. Uh, another interesting thing to do is to actually look at the edge of the moon. As you do see some topography, you see some ups and downs. On the edge of the moon here you can see uh, mountains or maybe edges of craters depending on how deep they are. I couldn't tell you for sure what that is uh, that we're looking at on the edge there. But regardless, it's there. Uh, now there's some other cool things we can point out on the moon here. We, we pointed out mountains, uh, but we also have really interesting features like this here. We can see this looks like maybe uh, maybe it was an impact, but it's really, it looks overexposed because it does appear so, so white in the screen here. This is a, maybe a little bit more complex than just a mountain feature. Um, certainly interesting to say the least. And uh, what else should we try to explore before we move on to another object? Let's see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, all right, thank you guys. Let's, uh, let's do something a little different. Let's try exploring another, another place. So we're gonna go ahead and head over to see, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to take a look at Jupiter. I think that's a, a good place to start next. Uh, so let me reroute the telescope. We can see what's going on there. And I think in the meantime, I might be able to hand this over to Jennifer in just a moment and let her talk about what we might expect to see on, on Jupiter, I think. Jennifer, are you there? Yes. Jennifer is is there, it sounds like. Let me make sure you guys can hear her. Jennifer, are you there? One more time. Yes, yes I, I am. am. Perfect. Okay, we're going to hand you guys over to Jennifer for just a moment while I align the telescope. All right. Hi, everybody. So we are about to see Jupiter. So there's a cool few things that we can see on Jupiter. First off, we all know the great red spot, so we may or may not be able to see that. On, on top, top of that, that we may get to see the Galilean moons. So that's like Io and uh, Ganymede and things like that. And so Jupiter's gonna be a really interesting thing to see. Yes, it, it will, yes. as soon as we get it in view. Uh, aligning the telescope is certainly not something that's easy to do or quick to do. That is for sure. So what else are we going to get to see today, Jim? Uh, we should be seeing Saturn. It should be pretty easy to get to Saturn. Uh, and then if we have time or we have enough uh, uh, other people who maybe want to see more, we might, we might go and see a few extra things. Things we might possibly be able to see, I would try to get in Hercules, the Hercules cluster. Um, that would be super neat to, to get visible for everybody to see. Deep space objects are awesome to see, especially with binoculars or telescopes. So if you have binoculars at home, 
definitely look for those. And if you want to see some more things, check out our weekly night sky videos because we'll teach you sort of how to see and where to find some more things. So how's the telescope coming along? It's going. I certainly uh, wouldn't mind if you continue talking about Jupiter. If you want to mention uh, some, some interesting facts about uh, how far away Jupiter is or how large it is. Alrighty, so we actually have a question. How big is Jupiter in relation to Earth? Well, so that's a fun thing. So we all know Earth is a pretty big place. So it'll take a little, a little while if we wanted to travel around the world, especially in 80 days. But Jupiter can hold a thousand Earths inside of it. So it is huge. It's much, much bigger. And it's also a gas giant, which means there's no solid ground. So we can't go over and jump on it because that's not going to work. In fact, if we did that, on top of some other things, we'd probably just sort of keep falling and falling and falling forever. And then the Great Red Spot is actually pretty big. So when we look at it, we're like, okay, well, it's pretty big in relation to Jupiter, but it actually can hold at least two Earths inside of it. So it's a pretty big thing. And then Jupiter is also our biggest biggest planet in the solar system and so but it's not as big as the sun the sun can hold a thousand jupiters inside of it so things are a lot bit bigger than, than we are and we also have another question jim what is the best type of telescope for deep space photography that's that's a tough one to answer i want to be honest with you uh, best type of telescope for deep space photography. I, I would have to suggest um, starting without a telescope and instead opting to go for more of a mount. Um, if you get a mount that can track, then most DSLR cameras can image many deep sky objects. So uh, being able to, um, for instance, being able to see uh, things like the Andromeda Galaxy, you don't need a fancy telescope, but DSLR camera can easily capture that, uh, even without a tracking mount. But with a tracking mount, you'll be able to collect so much more in the way of uh, colors or, or um, structure. Because uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, for instance, we won't be able to see tonight, but it is, it's huge. And because it's so big, uh, you can capture it pretty easily with the DSLR camera. That really adds uh, quite a lot to it, for sure. So we're going to go ahead and hand this back over to Jennifer as we're having a few little technical difficulties. Please bear with us here. Uh, oh, we, we just, just lost, lost your sound, sound. Jim. Okay. okay, can everyone hear me? I hope so. All right, so I have some more Jupiter facts. So we all know Earth, it has rocky, like uh, it's Terra, you know? So we have land on it. And so like I said, you can't go jumping on Jupiter. It's not gonna work out. Well, so Jupiter is actually mostly composed of two gases that you might have heard of before, hydrogen and helium. Now, okay, we all know helium, right? You know, you get a balloon, you suck up the gas in the balloon, your voice goes really, really high, that's helium. Now, hydrogen, on the other hand, if you know anything about history, uh, it likes to blow up. And so it doesn't work that well. But if you put them both together, and if you have a smaller, relatively smaller amount of gas, of mass, not gas, then you make a planet, and so it would be a gas giant. But if you have a large amount of mass, it'll make a star like we have our sun. And so there's a lot of other things, but Jupiter has dozens of moons. Uh, Jupiter also has rings, although you cannot see them as well as Saturn. Um, and partially that is because it does not reflect light. So Saturn's rings have ice in them which does reflect light. If you think about water, we can see our reflections in the water if you look at yourself in a lake on a lovely summer day. But if we don't have any ice and any rings and it's just a bunch of rock that don't reflect light, like you can't see yourself in a rock, 
if you do, that's a problem and you need to go talk to somebody about that. But if you don't have any ice, you don't have anything that reflects the sunlight, then you can't see the rings. But all gas giants have rings in our solar system. So Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. It's okay. All right. Let's see. So we also have a spacecraft named Juno that also study the planet a little bit and you can find any of those pictures on NASA. They're really cool. They're very up close and Jupiter looks like a whole completely different planet, but it has storms on it and they're pretty active. And so if you go into the atmosphere, you will find lightning. Okay. Let's see. So we're still having some, some work on the telescope, but no worries. So let's see. So we can see Jupiter. So Jupiter is located currently to the left of the Milky Way. But of course, if you're in a light pollution area, you can't see the Milky Way, but you can see Jupiter. Jupiter is very bright and it does sort of look like a star, but here's the thing. When you look at a planet at night, planets do not twinkle. So if you're looking at something and it's twinkling, then it's probably a star. If you're looking at something and it's twinkling and moving, that might be a satellite or an airplane. But if you're looking at it and it is not twinkling at all, and it's not actively moving, and of course it's moving, but not actively across the sky, it'll be a planet. And so that's a good thing. Are the different colors on Jupiter different gases? Yes, they are. They are different gases. I can't tell you which gases, but they are different gases. And so you'll also notice on Jupiter, there's more of bands around it instead of Saturn, where it looks a little bit more shaken up. So that has to do with how the, how the planet formed. Sometimes we get really nice shaken up cookies and other times we taste the flour in them. So sort of in a similar way. And then also, so Jupiter is actually named after the Roman king of the gods. So we all know the Greek king of gods, that's Zeus. And so the Roman equivalent is Jupiter. And so you'll notice our planets, besides Earth, are all named, uh, thank you, Elizabeth, are all named um, after Roman gods. So we have Mercury, who is Hermes, he's the messenger of the gods. We have Venus, who believe equates to Aphrodite, so she was absolutely beautiful. We have Earth, but Earth is just Earth. Then Mars, god of war. Jupiter, king of the gods. Saturn, Cronus, who was basically the father of Zeus. And then we have Neptune, who's Poseidon. And Uranus, who I don't remember who Uranus is. How many people have landed on the moon? I do not know an exact count, but I can look that up. Okay, we've had 12 humans land on the moon. And hopefully by 2024, we will have more humans land on the moon. On the moon. And it'll be everybody. And so that's called the Artemis program. And currently it's still on schedule, but we'll see how that goes. What's with all of the symmetrical storms? Why do they form so perfectly clustered? That is a good question. It probably has a... I'm not exactly sure, but it might be a geological thing. And so I can let you know about that in a little while. We will have to get back to you on that. So let's see. So another thing is I'm sure you've heard we might have found life on Venus. Now, before you get too excited, 
we don't actually know if we found life on Venus. So there's a gas that's being that we found called phosphine. And phosphine usually has a biological origin. However, we don't actually know the source um, that is causing all of this gas. And so it could be biological, it could be geological, or it could be something else. So we don't exactly know just yet. So don't get too excited. All right, so we're struggling with some technical difficulties. Um, our camera has is not cooperating with us right now, but hopefully we will get there soon. So let's see. Uh, I'm sure y'all have seen some new images of the sun. If you haven't, you need to go look at them. Um, we finally have high definition close up images of the sun and I'm going to be honest it looks a lot like popcorn and Amanda we did already see the moon we're waiting on the telescope to cooperate so we can see uh, Jupiter. Um, but they were um, the high definition photos are pretty pretty cool so you should definitely try to look up that. And while we're waiting, we can go ahead and talk about some other things. Um, so I'm sure y'all have heard about the Pluto controversy. Well, let me talk to you about that. So to be a planet, you have to be three things. You have to be a sphere, so you can't look like a potato. So you have to be a spheroid shape. You have to go around a star, so you can't be like a moon. You can't go around another planet. That doesn't work. And on top of that, you have to uh, have a clear orbit. So what does that mean? So to have a clear orbit, that means that, that you cannot have anything that's sort of like you in the same neighborhood. So like if we, if Earth was, I mean, Earth is a planet, but if we had another thing that was just as big as Earth and we're revolving around each other, we're not a planet anymore. And while well, Pluto is located in this area called the Kuiper Belt, and so the Kuiper Belt, it has about a hundred dwarf planets in it, and so it doesn't have a clear orbit. And on top of that, I learned the other day that Pluto is actually no bigger in diameter than Australia. So Pluto's pretty small. And it looks like our telescope is back up and running, so we will go ahead and switch over. Okay, guys, uh, please forgive us for that incredible delay. We had so many failures, but we've returned. And this is a live view of the, the planet Jupiter. So um, thank you guys for hanging on. We really appreciate it. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into this. So right now we are on the wrong screen. Let's let's update this so that we're looking at the planet Jupiter. Uh, the moon, as we mentioned before, was 240,000 miles away. The Jupiter, uh, the planet Jupiter, is actually 440 million miles away, uh, which is incredible. So really, really far away. Uh, the distance is really something I can't understand. Uh, the, the sun, for instance, is 93 million miles away, so Jupiter is, is just about four times as far away um, as, as uh, the sun is uh, itself. Uh, anyway, let's get into this. So we have a really great view of Jupiter right now. This telescope is showing us pretty clear. We don't get to see the great red spot, that's for sure, but we can definitely see the bands in its atmosphere. You can see those, as Jennifer mentioned, and there were questions uh, in the chat about it. Uh, you can see the um, kind of uh, rusty color bands and then we have some whiter color bands there. I want to point out one other thing. You can see a little bit of blue around the outside of the telescope. That's probably not due to the color of Jupiter so much as it has to do with the lenses we're using. We are using a bit of lenses and they can cause some weird uh, color changes in, in the way we what we'd see on the planet. So we, we blew a whole bunch of time talking about that um, uh, our failure here so we can move over if we have any questions about Jupiter before we probably return after all that work back to the moon 
as silly as that may sound. So let's let's go. Uh, Jennifer, uh, I have to see. Did you, Jennifer, by chance, did you answer the question about a meteor, meteorite, or an asteroid? No. Okay. Um, let's talk about that real quick. Uh, so the difference between a meteor, a meteorite, and an asteroid is, uh, at first glance, maybe maybe a little intimidating, but realistically, it's it's not too bad. So uh, a meteor is something that is out there in space. Usually, a meteor means it's coming to Earth. Uh, it's an object not on the ground yet, but coming to Earth. A meteorite is when it hits the ground. Once it's on the ground, we like to call rocks ites. I don't know why uh, geologists do this, but they like to call rocks ites. So you'll see many of them, stalactite. That might be one of those ideas. Um, and when it hits the ground, the meteor is no longer a meteor, it's a meteorite. And an asteroid is something that belonged at one time in the asteroid belt. So stuff can leave the asteroid belt, it can still be an asteroid even though it's not in the asteroid belt, but at one point it was in the asteroid belt, so it was visible uh, at that time. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and, and check uh, one more time before we leave. Um, there was that how far away is Jupiter from the Earth, we answered that thoroughly. As you can see it here as well, really far is the answer that I'd, I'd probably best give to children, no doubt about that. So once again, for those who have changed, we have new viewers in the chat. This is International Observe the Moon Night. Uh, so people all over the world get together to look at the moon, to be aware of it, and to show interest in astronomy and astrophysics um, that, that is accessible to everybody because it's so easy to see the moon. So if you have a pair of binoculars, just uh, aim those at the moon. You'll see incredible things. Uh, you probably won't be able to see Jupiter like this. But we can see some more, too. So uh, just for the sake of it, we had some people come into chat, ask about being able to see the moon. Uh, we're going to go ahead and head over to the moon, and hopefully with much less uh, problems than we had before. Small problem turned into a really big problem. Uh, but we'll go ahead and, and get going on that. So I will send us over to the moon. In the meantime, uh, just for a few moments, we will have Jennifer. She is going to help us here again in a moment. Not quite yet. Um, get to what we're going to. So, uh, yeah. Do you have any questions about the moon? Since uh, we may have a few viewers who haven't seen it in here just yet, um, please drop those in the chat. And uh, I want to just let you guys know that I am definitely sitting in my driveway right now of my house with just a laptop and a giant telescope at a tiny little table here. So, if you see trees behind me as my camera starts blowing out and changing its color temperature, uh, just just ignore those for me. Uh, anyway, we're going to hand this over to Jennifer again for just a few moments while we grab the moon a little bit closer. are switching back to me okay good news we got the moon we're back to the moon so if you guys wanted to see this we do have the moon visible in here again this is a huge crater uh, that we just we just rocketed away from let me slow down my telescope movement just a bit so we can have a better look at this uh, yes so the moon or our really our closest neighbor of anything in the solar system uh, is barren of any any way for us to really live. There's no air on the moon. Uh, the gravity is so much lower on the moon. I think you guys can see videos of astronauts tripping and fumbling over themselves because, well, we're so used to gravity here on Earth. It's something we don't really even think about because it's been there since we were born. Uh, the gravity that we feel on Earth uh, is pulling us to the ground. It's pulling all of our guts down and uh, we're used to responding to it. So when you get to the moon and you try to take a step you don't get pulled down at all. And of course, at the same time, and this is something the regular astronauts get to experience, uh, all, all your, your stomach and all your guts and your neck and your head aren't being pulled down like they would be on Earth. So that adds to some pretty crazy problems. Uh, stepping over this again, we're about to go to, to Saturn here in a bit, which is going to let us, force us to definitely slow some time down. I want to mention just a few more of these features we can see on the moon. So. Uh, the first thing that looking at the moon you would definitely be able to see are these large darker areas that are kind of flat looking. Long ago people thought that these were seas uh, or oceans. We call them maria today. 
Uh, we also, outside of the flat, darker areas, you can see some lighter areas if you're looking at the moon. Those lighter areas are more like highlands. Uh, they've got mountains in some places. We can see some mountain features here uh, that are visible in my frame. Uh, so we have mountains, we have plains. This is very similar to features we hear on Earth. A lot of the similar ge geology, geography uh, that you might find here on Earth. And uh, one question you might have, if you're seeing the similarities of what structures you might see on the moon, is what is the moon made of, right? That's a very like immediate question you might ask yourself. Uh, what is the moon made of? Well, to be honest, this is going to be a little bit of a bummer to hear, but the same stuff the Earth is. Uh, interesting, though, not just the same stuff, but like the same uh, real stuff. And that's because we think, well, it's not because, but we think that the moon came from the Earth. There was an impact really long time ago uh, that ripped off a huge outer layer of the Earth. And we had a ring system. The Earth actually had a ring system for... Uh, quite a long time before it slowly coalesced into the moon we have today. So um, uh, we think that there were two large pieces that eventually collided and created the moon we have, which is kind of why, and you can't see this from Earth, but the moon is uh, quite egg-shaped. It's not perfectly spherical uh, by any means. Not that the Earth is, but the moon is certainly much less spherical than the Earth, for sure. Uh, but yeah, let's let's take a little bit uh, more of a look here. We have any questions about the moon before we leave again? Uh, we got, uh, do we know the size of the largest crater on the moon? I think I get to tell you the best answer in science, uh, Christopher. The answer to your question, no, I don't know. But we are going to ask Jennifer very kindly to look that up and send me the answer <laughs> and see if it's visible. It might be visible right now. Um, I know that uh, there are so many craters on the back side of the moon that I don't know of. So maybe on this side of the moon, uh, we have huge crate, uh, craters like uh, Kepler and um, uh, Tycho, so we'll, we'll have to look to see uh, uh, with an answer from Jennifer soon. Uh, anyway, when Elon Musk builds a lunar Starbucks, will we be able to see it with some good binoculars? No, not unless it's humongous. I mean, imagine looking at, at uh, Russia from a space telescope or from the moon. It would be really hard to pinpoint a Starbucks. Uh, on the continent of Russia. Very, very difficult. Not easy to do. And stuff is really small. So you can, with with a telescope, you know, like uh, the Hubble, turn the Hubble telescope towards the moon and pick out these things like the lunar landers. But I, I don't think you would even be able to see it very well. We get our images of the lunar landers and um, the rovers and even tracks they left on the moon, which is an interesting question alone. You can still see the tracks that our little lunar rovers left. Uh, when the astronauts from the later Apollo um, programs, when those astronauts actually uh, got to the moon, they brought with them a little go-kart and it left tracks and those are all still there and still visible from the satellites that orbited the moon and took lots of photos there. So really, really neat. Uh, will the moon ever cross into the space where the rush limit would destroy it? Uh, no. Not for Earth. The moon, this is kind of sad, is leaving us constantly. So right now the moon is getting farther and farther away from us. That's a bummer, right? What that really means, this is kind of a, a, a crazy cause and effect thing. That means that um, while it's getting farther and farther away from us, it makes having solar eclipses more and more difficult because the moon is going to get smaller and smaller, which won't cover up the entire disk of the sun. And if it doesn't cover up the entire disk of the sun, we only get an annular eclipse. That probably is not going to happen in our lifetime or our grand, great, great grandchildren's lifetime. But at some point, it, it will. Uh, what's with all the recent international interest in getting to the moon? Japan, China, India, U.S., everyone's trying to get to the moon. This is a good thing, uh, I think. Fantastic question, Kurt. Really appreciate that. Um, what's with the interest right now? I don't know if I could tell you what particular interest there is with getting to the moon. China got to the moon. I think China is trying to flex uh, their scientific prowess right now. They're really doing well. They've got a lot of research going on and a lot of great minds, and they're doing incredible work uh, in China uh, in research. Uh, they were able to land a rover on the backside of the moon, which is quite a feat. Um, uh, I, I think we'd love to go back to the moon. What I think the big interest is, is that now we have private industry, at least in the U.S., that is becoming capable enough to get to the moon. And uh, that is making interest go up, which is fantastic for our scientific community in, in general. 
um, especially for astronomy. And um, this is a, a really good thing. But certainly if, if only the United States is interested in going to the moon, if it's just us who are interested in going to the moon, um, then we don't have other people trying to beat us. And one of the reasons we got to the moon in the first place in, in the late 60s uh, was because we needed to beat Russia, right? Or sorry, the Soviet Union, not, not just Russia. But we needed to beat the Soviet Union. And that competition spurred us to do it. Now, it was certainly irresponsible. We did things much faster than we should have, and we weren't being as safe as we probably could have been. Um, but fortunately, we did not um, lose too many Americans in the process. But either way, uh, we did get to the moon. There's no doubt about that. Uh, hopefully that interest keeps going and, and really gets us to the moon farther. Anyway, uh, we, saw, we saw Jupiter a little while ago. We saw the moon. This is our second trip back to the moon. Uh, we're going to go ahead and leave the moon shortly. So I am hopefully going to hand it back over to Jennifer while I get to Saturn and uh, see how much trouble we have trying to find Saturn. So please bear with us while we... While we do that, we try to find Saturn. I'm going to uh, hand it back over to you. Jennifer, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Okay. I've got to mute myself so that they don't get to hear you twice. So, muting myself and... Uh... Alrighty. Sorry about that earlier. My internet decided to go on me. But no worries. So, we are about to go to Saturn. So, that's going to be really interesting. We'll get to see Saturn's rings, hopefully. Um, which will be always a beautiful sight because the rings of Saturn is just amazing to see. Um, I actually do want to add on to your question, Kurt. So, um, so while, of course, with the space race, it was the space race, so there's a whole lot of competition involved. But now especially, now everyone wants to go to the moon partially because we want to stay there. We want to build a base. And if we build a base, we can build rockets that we can't really build here on Earth because they're going to be pretty big. And hopefully, eventually, we'll get to go to Mars. So the question goes to, well, why should we go to space? Well, on top of it's cool and we get to explore a little, we're actually doing a whole lot of cool new things. So right now on the ISS, we're actually doing a lot of tissue regeneration. And they're actually able to make corneas like for your eye um, on the space station that we would not be able to do here on earth because we need to be in a zero g acceleration environment and so it'd be pretty cool and then uh jim said he's ready so let's go, go ahead, ahead and hand, hand it off, off to him. him all right guys we have returned and it says the moon there ignore that let's switch over to saturn uh we want to transition to saturn so if you saw that change in the approximate distance, we can go back and forth to that. So if we say um, the moon's distance, 240,000 miles, Jupiter's distance, 440 million miles, and then Saturn uh, is nearly twice as far away from us as Jupiter is, with 740 million miles. Uh, being honest with myself, I can't tell you that I know what a million miles means. Um, I think I know what the number million means. I think I could probably imagine what a million of something is, but it's a bit of a stretch. 740 million? <laughs> no way. Uh, it's phenomenal. That's the, when I get the question in the planetarium about what, what is the most interesting fact about space, um, it's the distance. And Jupiter is very far. Saturn is even farther. And when you see Saturn for the first time in a telescope like this, this is phenomenal. So I hope you guys Hope there are some of you. If, if this is your first time to see uh, Saturn through a telescope, um, this is the most socially distanced way to do it. This is really live. Um, I could prove that to you by shaking the camera. I'm just going to give it a little tap. You can see that shake. That was just me stepping on the ground. <laughs> but uh, this is the rings of Saturn, and we actually have so much clarity in the telescope that I, I'm probably imagining it, but I do feel like in this image you might be able to see uh, a band of atmosphere even on Saturn. It does have bands like Jupiter, not nearly as uh, clear or as contrasted as the bands on Jupiter, um, but Saturn does. You can also see, uh, it looks like in this image, you can see a separation in rings. So it looks like you see the major ring system that goes closer to Saturn than on the outside. You can actually see uh, just a tiny bit thinner area of rings. One thing we didn't see when we looked at Jupiter 
uh, or when we're looking at Saturn right now, uh, is moons. And that's just because of the way I'm looking at Saturn with the telescope right now. Uh, if I could zoom out a little bit, and I don't have that ability, this is not a, a point and shoot camera, I just can't click zoom out. But if I could, you would be able to see the moons there uh, around Saturn. And when we were looking at Jupiter, you'd be able to see the moons of Jupiter too. So this is International Observe the Moon Night, and I'm only showing you one moon. That seems kind of like, kind of rude, maybe. But they're there. I don't, it might be possible to see if I can get lucky and, and scoot over if you can see a Saturn moon. No, not visible or the other way. I don't want to test it by getting too far away. Maybe right before we're done tonight, we'll take a little bit of a view uh, at Jupiter and try to see those. I, I think it would be possible to see the moons of Jupiter. I do have this really underexposed once again, uh, just so we can see a little bit more features on it. So it's, it's dark for you guys to see. Uh, questions we get about Saturn that are that are really interesting to talk about are the rings. In images, they look solid, right? The rings of Saturn are certainly not solid. Um, I'm getting reports of a, a loud noise in the background. And while I can't hear it myself, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that... Um, I, I think it's going to be bugs. <laughs> we live in Texas. I'm fighting them as they're hitting me in the face as we speak. Uh, and of course, I'm bug sprayed up, but I am outside in Texas. So I think that's what it is. I hear a loud, loud noise as well. So if you hear that, I'm sorry. I'm outside. There's no way around this, unfortunately, just because of what we're dealing with. We had a question in the chat. looks like uh, from uh, Kurt. Imaging circling, imagine circling Earth's equator almost 20,000 times at 700. Okay, that's a great, that wasn't a question, but uh, Kurt, that was, there's so many ways to try to imagine these distances like Kurt is doing there, and I think it's, it's a fantastic thing to do, a little uh, exercise to try to understand the distance. It's just incredible. Uh, Amanda asks, uh, so cool, uh, where do you go to see the sky? We tried to see that comet last month and couldn't because of light pollution. So uh, I, I have to tell you the answer you don't want to hear, and that's your backyard. And uh, you, if you live in the middle, let's just say you live in downtown Dallas, you're, you're not going to have a good time viewing the sky. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but you could still certainly see some things. And starting somewhere easy, safe, and comfortable is the best way to, to approach this. Um, something that people don't think about, and this is really hard because it's the 21st century and we have cell phones is that if you want to see the sky really well and be able to see lots of stars um, uh, and you know easily pick out the planets, which those should be easier to pick out than stars. Honestly, they're so, so bright. Uh, if you're outside tonight, you can see, if you could look at the moon in your backyard, I think most of DFW is clear skies. Uh, you can see Jupiter really easy. You just look at the moon tonight and then look to your right just a little bit and Jupiter should be the brightest thing there. And then right between Jupiter and the moon is another not so bright object, and that's actually Saturn. So I can look up right now, and I have a, a bright lamp in my face, and I can see all three of those even with a bright light in my face. So Now anyway, as I was mentioning, to see uh, a dark sky, what we suggest that you do, what I think is a good um, thing to do when you're outside in your own backyard, is to just not look at any lights whether that means close your eyes or just look straight up at the sky, but make sure there's no light obstructing you so there's not a street light in your way. Make sure you're not looking at your cell phone and do that for, and this is the most difficult part, for 15 minutes. If you cannot look at any bright lights for 15 minutes, even from downtown Dallas, well, as long as you don't have a light in your view, um, you can see it. But my suggestion, Amanda, on where to go if you want to go somewhere else, uh, I would say Dinosaur Valley. Dinosaur Valley State Park, it's in Glen Rose, Texas. You can see so much. You can see the Milky Way there if you know where you're looking. Uh, you can see without any telescopes, you can see the Andromeda galaxy as well. So not only can you see our own galaxy, the Milky Way, but you can see other galaxies. Um, if you live on North DFW, I would recommend going to uh, Ray Roberts Lake State Park. Um, that, that state park has also got a really dark sky. Not quite as dark as Dinosaur Valley, but it may be more conveniently located for you guys. Uh, the main reason I suggest state parks is because there are usually park police officers there 
and other staff that are going to help make sure you guys have whatever you need. And if you go to a state park, always let them know you want to do this so that they know to keep an eye out for you. And if you're in a certain parking lot viewing this guy, they know to not hit you with bright lights and their truck lights. Uh, they're always really wonderful to help out with that. But yeah, Kurt also mentions that there is an online dark side locator. Let me see if you can find the link. Uh, I think we can link ours. Um, Jennifer was doing some research for us uh, a couple weeks ago. We've been really busy with a lot of changes we're excited to announce to you guys. Not during this live stream, but soon. Um, and uh, she, she found some of these locators. So there's some scales and websites that will show you light pollution areas or areas where there's a lot of light from cities and that makes seeing the stars pretty difficult anyway um yeah for those of you who just popped on we have a few new viewers uh we are looking at saturn in the telescope right now um this is our 11 inch telescope so it's not super big but it's certainly uh not a small telescope by by any means at least for amateur astronomy to say the least so uh if we have any any other suggestions any other requests on places you guys would like to go that i could try to locate uh, our computerized telescope mount that would usually we have the ability to just tell it where we want to go is not responding super well. It is tracking, so I don't have to push any buttons to keep it in there, but um, me finding these things, this is all just freehand, so that's why we're having to delay and, and hand it over to Jennifer as we go through. Yeah, so we've seen Saturn. Uh, you know, just since we're here, I might as well try to move over to Jupiter, see if we can locate Jupiter uh, in view. Let's go ahead and pop off Saturn for a little bit. Because I think if we go to Jupiter, we might be able to see some of those moons. And uh, then we can international observe the moon's night, not just our own uh, Earth satellite. So we'll head that direction towards Jupiter, and we'll get to look to it. And we're going to check in on Jennifer to see if she is still there and available. Because she's going to talk a little bit um, uh, while, while we try to stall for you. So Jennifer, are you there? I am. All right. Well, here you go. All right. So we have some questions in the chat. Are there any other planets visible right now? Not in the night sky. In the night sky, it is just Saturn and Jupiter. Um, but in the morning sky, you can see Venus, Mars, and I believe still Mercury. And so you can look at the morning sky. But that would be about 5 a.m. So if you want to wake up at 5 a.m., go for it. I know I... Probably don't. I like to sleep. Um, so unfortunately, no, we can't see Mars or Venus as well because once again, you'd have to look at it in the morning. But if you have some binoculars, once again, take your binoculars out and uh, try to locate those. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, if you have any more questions, please just drop them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, let's see. So, yes, Kurt, the Dark Side Finder is a really great place. Uh, also, the light pollution map is also really good. And so any of those, definitely look them up. And if you go anywhere outside where there's not a whole lot of light pollution, it is going to be a beautiful sight. Like, you can't even imagine it. Because if you go out far enough, you could even see the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is a sight to be seen. So we have a lot of things in the night sky right now. Um, besides just planets and the moon, uh, you might be able to see a couple of stars. Um, you also might be able to see a couple of um, satellites or airplanes just as well. And so go outside, take a look, and if you need something to look at because you just don't know where to look, uh, you should try out this website called Stellarium. Uh, Stellarium is a really, really great thing to download. It is completely free, so you don't have to worry about that. But we use it at home um, in, in place of our regular system at the planetarium. And there's also a mobile app as well. About how many years has the Great Red Spot been on Jupiter? So we know it's at least 150. I know I was taught that it's, it's at least 300 years, so it's a really, really old thing. Um, but the weird thing is, is that it is actually shrinking. So we knew that it used to be about the size of three Earths, and now it's about the size of two Earths. So it is shrinking. Uh, it may disappear, but it also may not. So we'll have to just keep an eye on that to see how it goes. Um, 
So we're still working on the telescope. We're trying to get everything figured out. But uh, here's some other fun facts um, just about Saturn. So Saturn is actually less dense than water. So, well, what does that mean? So basically, if you have a bathtub big enough, Saturn would float. So Saturn would become your rubber ducky, like in a bath. And so it's really interesting. They also found more moons of Saturn. So now there is a total of 82 moons for Saturn. So there's a whole lot of moons out there. And then we have uh, the Cassini spacecraft that uh, also took some pictures of Saturn. And if you ever want to see some really good pictures that you can share, anything like that, go to images.nasa.gov. Most of those are public domain in images, so you don't have to worry about any of that. And you can get some really awesome views. And there's a lot of really dramatic photos of Saturn out there, too. A lot of black and white. So they're pretty interesting. All right, so we are almost there, but I'm going to keep talking just a little bit. So we also have Mars. So I want to talk about Mars just a little bit. So we know that there is uh, hopefully some water ice on Mars. We're also trying to go to Mars. And so that would be really cool. Uh, we also know we have some robots there. So a really interesting thing is that uh, the US, we tried to send uh, robots to Venus, but all of our robots did not make it to Venus. Um, Russia tried to send all of their probes and robots to Mars, but that didn't happen. So we switched places and now ours are on Mars and theirs are on Venus, although that'll change a little bit. All right, we've got a question from Kurt. Will Elon's many satellite constellations become a major obstruction to observation or will they be more like a needle in a haystack? Well, so that is a very good question. So while the satellites are doing some good things, they are obstructing the view just a little bit. And it has caused a lot of concerns because they haven't even launched, I think, even a quarter of them. And so they're really going to light up our night sky. So we'll have to keep an eye out and we'll sort of just have to see, but hopefully not. Uh, what are Saturn's rings made of? So they're made of rock and dust, but they're also made of ice. And if you're just getting here, uh, I said before that Saturn's rings, the ice in them, a lot of it is water ice. And if you go to a clear lake on a lovely summer day, you can see yourself in the water. And so, but you can't see yourself in the rock. And so we can see Saturn's rings because of that concept, but we can't see the other gas giants. And Jim is ready, so let's go ahead and turn it back over to him. All right, you guys. So we have Jupiter back. Uh, if anybody missed Jupiter, we do have it in, in view now. Um, once again, just to mention a little bit about Jupiter, my, my setting is set to Saturn, so let me switch it over to Jupiter. We want to show you guys that information. It's 440 million miles away, extremely, extremely far away. Uh, looking at Jupiter here, we still can't really see any of the great red spot that that I feel comfortable saying that's what it is. But you can once again see the bands uh, of uh, atmosphere on Jupiter. You can see those contrasting kind of a rusty color band and then more of a white color band. These are just different areas uh, in Jupiter where there's a, maybe a little bit more uh, density of certain matter than, than the other. So uh, they're different stuff. Probably not like substantially different stuff, but they're definitely different stuff. Um, we have a question uh, that says, do all the planets have moons? Um, that's a good question. Jennifer talked a little bit about it. Short answer is, is um, no. No, uh, Mercury doesn't have any moons at all. Venus doesn't have any moons. Uh, and for both of those planets, just as in all science, as far as we know now, Venus has no moons. And as far as we know now, Mercury has no moons. Earth has one. Uh, Mars has two, Phobos and Deimos. They're both shaped like potatoes, so they're not nearly as, um, I feel like classical, you might think, of the moon being round, right? Um, they're, not, they're not round like we would see our moon. And Jupiter goes way up. Uh, Saturn really, really high. And then as you get farther out, so um, Uranus and Neptune, the moons do drop down a little bit likely just due to mass and their location in the solar system. They're not near as much you know, or as, as many objects. Um, Pluto, though, 
one of the big things that we thought maybe Pluto is, is a planet early on is because it has moons, not one or two or three or four. It has like seven moons, I think, five or seven moons. We'll have to wait, see if I can get Jennifer to confirm or deny how many moons that is. She'll hopefully send me that little answer. But uh, yeah, Pluto has moons, plural, uh, which also kind of really complicates its whole should it be called a planet? Probably not. Because of those moons and the size of the moons relative to the size of Pluto, the planet itself, they don't necessarily orbit a place inside of Pluto. Um, it's more, in some small way, you could almost imagine them as a huge air debris field that's kind of rotating. Technically, they still are rotating around. Uh, Jennifer got to me. She said five. We have Karen, Hydra, Kerberos, Nix, and Styx. Uh, fun names. Fun names. I think if you're a theater person, you might you might recognize some of those. It's certainly possible. Uh, we had a question that says, what are Saturn's rings made of? I don't know if I missed that or if Jennifer already answered it, but uh, stuff. Can I say that? Is that a reasonable answer? A lot of stuff. Just We're going to say silicates and ice. So uh, small rock particles and ice particles that make up the rings. Uh, part of the reason we think the rings are so visible are because uh, is because of the presence of ice. Not necessarily water ice, but other ices there. So maybe um, carbon dioxide ice and other other ices you might find uh, in in nature. Um, we have a moon on Saturn called Enceladus that has ice volcanoes that we think actually recoat or re-add ice to uh, the rings of Saturn. So it's interesting. I don't know how much evidence there is for that. You know. A lot of the stuff in, in astronomy um, is observational um, because we can't go out to these objects and touch them and grab chunks of the rings and bring them back and study them. Uh, so much of astronomy is observational. We look, we say this is what we think is happening, and then we try to look at it in different ways and, and prove or show that that's most likely. Anyway, uh, as promised, I do want to, for the sake of it, I want to try uh, to show you guys moons outside of the Earth, because I think we can get them in this telescope, but you're going to have to be patient with me. So I'll move Jupiter just a little bit. Um, you can see it move, hop just a little bit, and then I'm going to blow Jupiter out. I want to make it look pretty bad. Uh, I'm going to bring up the, the brightness quite a bit, so you'll no longer be able to see it really well. But if you look in frame, how bright can I get it? You can see them. Oh, we got them. Three moons! Fantastic! What a great shot! This is actually incredible. I'm so happy to get to show you guys this. So in the view of the screen right now, if you're using a, a mobile device, it may be a little bit hard to see, but we have Jupiter, this huge blown out area. This is actually Jupiter. You can't see its lines anymore because I've brightened up the, the camera so much, but you can see three little dots and a nice line there. Those are moons of Jupiter and very likely they're the Galilean moons. So I don't know which one's which. I would have to do some some checking on that, but uh, of the Galilean moons, we have uh, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io. So three of those four names. Uh, I wonder if we can get the fourth one visible on the other side of Jupiter. Ooh, ooh. Please be patient with me, guys. I'm going to try this. This is this a bad decision? I don't see any moon, so we're going to we're going to give up and surrender. Uh, I think. I get to be a little bit bummed by saying we only get to show you guys three of the four moons. But still, it means I've showed you guys. I think we can see it. Uh, there's a, a, a slightly, slightly lit up part in the upper left-hand corner. If you can't see it, don't worry about it. It's there. But we showed you four moons, uh, four moons at least. To say so we're gonna go ahead and end this now you guys you bear with us thank you so much for dealing with um, our, our delay we had we had some technical difficulties in the middle of the stream too uh, we do plan to do these more often and we are going to be using our observatory on campus while it may be in a little bit worse light pollution um, it's a much bigger much more powerful telescope so we'll get to see even more uh, yeah if we have any last minute questions in the chat, you guys can drop them. Otherwise, um, I'm gonna let Jennifer say anything if she has anything. Uh, Jennifer, are you are you there? Yes. I just wanna say thanks for coming and thanks for bearing with me. And I hope this inspires you to maybe go out and get a telescope so you can see the sky for yourself. Uh, 
Okay, I'm back. Well, uh, once again, thank you everybody for, for checking out the stream and seeing all these beautiful pictures. Uh, hope to do these again and show them to you guys. Uh, as always, drop more comments in the chat. Any of this feedback is just ideas for us to use for future streams. And we're always excited to, to bring you guys these things. So anyway, without further ado, thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and end the stream. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. I'm so